many things happen in this chapter. I mean, chapter three, so many things happen in all of the chapters. This is such a big difference from Moby Dick where nothing happened in chapter after chapter after chapter. And here it's like 15 million different things happen. So they start out and they want to make all of these various accoutrements. They want to make harnesses for the animals. They want to make bridges. They want to make... And they don't have necessarily all of the tools that they need to make these things. So at one point, the mom was going to sew up harnesses, but she couldn't sew up the harnesses because she didn't have needles. Now, needles can be something kind of difficult to make because it's a very fine piece of metal work and you kind of have to have it nice and smooth and straight and even. And then you have to put a little teeny tiny hole in it. And by putting a little teeny tiny hole at the end of it that you can run a thread through, makes it very difficult it bulges out it makes it prone to breaking there and so that's really fine work and you need like a forge to do that and they didn't have a forge because in order to make a forge you needed a large amount of rock and then you need so it's like this whole big list of things that you need just to make a needle but they killed a porcupine now porcupines have the long quills and it was an old wives tale back 150 years ago and they were like, no, porcupines don't throw their, and porcupines don't throw their quills. They just have the quills, and yeah, if they run, they come off, because, you know, they're kind of loosely attached, but they don't throw the quills, and it was an old wives' tale back then, but the quills have been used by Native Americans as needles, and they are excellent for that. And so what the father did was he took a hot nail and melted a hole in the back end of the quill, now, porcupine quills are made from keratin, the same thing that hair is made of, the same thing that fingernails are made from, the same thing that um, a, rhinoceros, a rhinoceros's horn is made from. They're all made from something called keratin, which is the protein. And it has the property that it can be melted. So he took a hot nail, drove it through, it kind of burned, kind of melts, and he made whole bunch of needles for his wife out of the porcupine quills, which she then used to make harnesses for the animals. And they took all of their stuff and they moved up to a tree house. And that's something that the Swiss family Robinson was famous for, was that they lived in the tree house. If you watch the movie, you'll see them all living up in their tree house. And that's where they, for the most part, lived. And so that's one of the th one of the many, many things that happened in this chapter. They built a house and it took a little while. It probably took several days. I can't imagine that they actually did it in the two days that it sounds like it actually took them. But that, that's one of the things about these books is that, you know, it's like they do all of this incredible work and it looks like it doesn't take all that much time. But I spent the better, better part of an afternoon making a bench with power tools and though admittedly my skills are not good so the the length of time it took was probably more a sign of how poor I am at doing it rather than the effort involved but the effort involved is more than just like okay we'll just throw up a house uh I mean hordes of Amish do it and it still takes days you know if you have 20 Amish men working on a house and these are people who build houses only it still takes them a couple of days to get it thrown together so seven people most of them small children probably take a little while anyway so they built the house they moved up and they talked about crayfish now crayfish as a little kid seven eight years old I used to go and catch crayfish in the creek and crayfish are like little lobsters. They're like eh, three inches long, four inches long. Maybe little ones are like an inch and a half long. I've never eaten any, one of, the, any of the ones that I've caught. I have eaten crayfish before. And because they're arthropods and related to shrimp, they taste like shrimp. They taste like lobster. Uh, they have a stronger taste than lobster because typically the bigger it is, the less it tastes. But anyway, so little crayfish. And here's how you catch a crayfish. Here's the easy way if you because if you go at a crayfish from the front side, they have these pinchers and they go and they pinch and they it hurts. 
I mean, these are these are some serious serious pinchers, and they can pinch you and you can bleed and it hurts. But what you do, oh, and they have this big floppy tail, and the big floppy tail they can flap and they just like shoot backwards. See, the thing is, is that although they have good vision behind them, they don't have quite perfect vision. And so when they shoot backwards, they shoot backwards about uh, a foot. So in the water, they shoot backwards about a foot, maybe nine inches. So what you do is you take a cup or a plastic bag, or you just put your hand there six inches behind them. Then you make a disturbance in front of them, not close enough to get pinched, but you make a disturbance in front of you, you start going tw six inches behind them. You make a disturbance in front of them, and they dart back in your head, and you just scoop them up. It's like, I have a crayfish. <laughs> then you put it back in the water and release it because you aren't going to eat it. It's like, that's how you catch a crayfish. And they talk about flamingos, and flamingos are beautiful, beautiful pink birds. And they're pink because of what they eat. They eat the shrimp, and the shrimp turn them pink. And they're because shrimp have the pink coloring in them. But anyway, flamingos, beautiful birds. And they, oh, yes, all sorts of the clever building invention things. So he talked about a measuring the height of the thing. 35 feet. You can't throw a rope 35 feet up. I mean, maybe if you're a professional athlete and you have a properly sized and weighted thing, you might be able to get it up 30 feet. But throwing it up 30 feet with a uh, rope tied around it and then pulling up the string. That's a bit of an ask. But what he did was he took a stick and he knows how long the stick is. And he walks out a set distance. What walks out a measured distance. And so you can use the height of the stick and the distance you are from the stick to get the height of the tree and the distance from the tree. Because, um, it's geometry. The two things are related. So if the stick is a foot tall and it's a foot away from you, then something 50 feet away from you is going to be 50 feet tall. Or if the stick is two feet tall and a foot away from you, then something 50 feet away from you is going to be 100 feet tall. Because that's the way it works. You take the triangle and it just kind of scales out. And, you know, there's all sorts of fancy mathematic proofs to this but I mean you just kind of look at it and you go hey it's a triangle and so I know the length of I know the length of the base of the triangle I know the length of the height and because the two triangles are inside of each other you know the two triangles the lines all line up that means that if I just take this one and scale it up well I know how much I scale it up because I know the length of the base so I just scale up that and so it's like okay I am 35 feet. That's 35 feet up. And they made a bow and arrow. And this is a very crude bow and arrow. Um, bows are a masterpiece. They are hard to make. Um, well, if you want to make them that are powerful and last. I mean, there are people who study for years on how to properly make a bow. And people who study for years on how to properly make an arrow. So they're, you know, they're like apprenticeships. Um, it's kind of interesting. If you were to go to like the Ren Fair and you see the archer there and the Fletcher and the, the Fletcher is someone who makes arrows. Uh, the archer is someone who shoots a bow. And I can't remember right now what the name of the person is who makes the bows. Wait, anyway, bow right. The bow right makes the bows. So you have somebody who makes bows, you have someone who makes an arrow, and sometimes somebody does both. And, you know, I spoke with a guy at the Ren Fair. It's like, that is so incredible. It's like, how do you learn to do this? It's like, I had a seven-year apprenticeship. And now it probably is it seven years of constantly doing nothing but making bows. But this that was the way it was learned way back when, when bow making was a thing in the you know, in the 10th century, the 12th century, where, you know, it's like, okay, you are going to be a bow maker. And so you spend years learning how to make a bow, picking the right wood. Now, bamboo is good for arrows because it's long and straight. Um, and it's okay. It's not really good for bows, but it can be serviceable. 
And in this case, it's like he only had to get one shot. And it didn't have to be a very good one. Because, you know, bows, a longbow, the classic English longbow, has a 100-pound pull. Which means it takes 100 pounds of force to go like this and pull an arrow. And that's a lot of force to pull. Um, I pulled a hundred pound bow once. Oh, actually, no, I pulled a 60 pound bow once and that was unpleasant. And yeah, I could have held it and I could have fired an arrow, but, and I might've managed to get a hundred pound bow pulled, but I mean, yeah, but he didn't have to have that powerful of a bow. All he had to do was have one to get it 35 feet. And actually, at 35 feet, he probably could have gotten 40, 50 feet of pole, put a stone at the end and gone, yeah, levered it up. Also, I love the contrivance that he used to get the bridge across. Building the first part of a bridge is always the hardest part. Because you, once you have the first part of the bridge built, you can use that part to build the other parts. But it's always getting the first part built. So what he did was, it's not perfectly described. He took a rope, he put it up over a tree on his side. And then he walked across the river, on the rocks, on the stones, down the bank, up the bank on the other side, tossed it up over a branch on the far side of the river. Tossed what up? Tossed the rope up over a branch on the far side of the river. And they came back with the rope. So he has this rope that goes up a branch on one side, across, down a branch on the other side, and then back across, kind of forming a triangle. And he tied that to a board, big plank. He had a fortunately 24-ish foot long board from the rack. Had he had to find and make a board that big, it would have taken day, you know, you would have had to find a tree. You'd have to cut the tree. You'd have to, like, strip the bark, plane it, cut it down. That's huge amounts of work. He just happened to find three of them. And what he did was he tied the rope to the board, and he tied the other end of the rope to the donkey. So the donkey pulled on the rope going up the tree, which pulls on the rope going across the river, which pulls on the rope going down and back across. So that means the end of the board gets lifted up and pulled across the far side of the river. So you have this board being dragged across the open chasm. And if you didn't have this, the only other way to do this, or the other way to do this, if you can't reach up from underneath and hold the board, because, you know, if you have a whole bunch of people, you can lift up the board from underneath and carry it across and then put it down. The only other way to do this would have been to have everyone balanced on one side and cantilever it up. But the problem is, is that because the board is long, it's a whole bunch of weight that you have to, like, lift up at the far end. And because, as I explained with the lever, the longer the lever, the more force you need at this end, you know, the more force gets applied at the short end. So it would have been really difficult had they had to do it without pulling the rope across. So they built a bridge... They built a tree house. They have hammocks. They have dogs with collars and all sorts of great things like that. And they are making progress. They are making progress on building their own civilization.